Nathan talked about what he talked about a while ago. I was sitting down at Brian's the other day and a guy come in and told this story. Uh, he was at Nieberg's in Effingham and evidently they have big round tables where a bunch of guys get around and sit and drink coffee and discuss politics. So this story went on and on. They talked and talked. And this guy sat there and listened. And finally he said, let me ask you men something. Are you Christians? And several of them sitting around the table said yes. And the man just got up and walked out. You know, it, he planted that seed. So he went outside. He got in his truck. Going to leave. He said he rushed down to put the key in the switch and somebody knocked on the door. And he said, I thought, uh oh, I'm going to get whipped. He said, I looked up, rolled the window down, and there was a man standing there, and he said, I want to tell you thanks for standing up for being a Christian. You know, each one of us can do the same thing out in the world that we live in. You know, we're supposed to be his disciples. We're supposed to act and think and do what Jesus would do. So if you have that opportunity, plant a seed somewhere. You'll make a difference. This week, as I thought about communion, I thought about sin. In the same token, our world, as Nathan mentioned, there's very little love in the world today. Um, and I thought about, well, how do we get rid of sin? And I thought about the old song that we used to sing, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And as I looked at that song, there was a heading up on the top. And it said, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from every sin. And then I thought about, I have a lot of friends that worked on construction and a lot of them never had communion on Sunday. They just had communion once a month or whatever it might be. And I thought about, well, the first church, it says the fellowship of the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then I remembered the words that Paul said, he said, For I receive from the Lord, but I also pass on to you. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray with me? Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he was willing to go to that cross where he was nailed to it, where he bled and suffered and died for my sins and for the sins of the world. Father, thank you so much for this communion service, the loaf which represents his body, the cup which represents his shed blood. Father, we know that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sin. Father, we ask that you forgive us whenever we do fail you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
a little extra silent silence for meditation time today. Uh, I forgot to ask anyone to play anything. Uh, our all of our piano players are gone today, and so uh, that is my fault. So sorry about that. You've probably heard the old uh, saying, "Practice makes perfect." Probably each and every one of us have heard that at some time before, meaning that if you want to get good at something, you have to practice. In fact, we see that in sports. Often the best teams aren't necessarily the, most, the ones with the most raw talent because if they've never practiced together, they've never learned chemistry, they've never learned how to get along and play with one another. And so what they need is actually practice. Yes, talent is important when it comes to sports, but it's not everything. Honestly, often a team that has one super talented person will lose to someone that has a very good team. And the reason for that is because the team practice together. They, un- uh, they work together perfectly and in harmony. And so therefore, practice made perfect. At night, before we put A.V. to bed, often Kelsey and I, we uh, go back and forth. I'll put A.V. to bed one night, and the next night I'll put Jameson in bed, and then the following night I'll do A.V. again. Well, A.V. loves it when we tell her stories. And she doesn't want to hear a story she knows. She wants us to make up a story on the spot. Well, Kelsey kind of dreads this. She doesn't really like doing it. And so often she'll instead uh, take her phone in there and they'll sing a Disney song together in order to, (laughs) so she can get out of telling the story. But I enjoy telling stories. I enjoy making things up. And so often I'll tell A.V. a short story just off the cuff. And I try as much as possible to kind of have this, have some sort of point to it. Not just a fun story, and yes, I want it to be a fun story, but I want to teach her something if possible. And earlier this week, I don't know if it was because I had read the text and it was in my mind or what, I decided to tell a story about practice, about practicing something. I didn't realize at the time that uh, it was probably in my head because I had already read this part of uh, 2 Peter, but I think that's probably why it was there. And so I told her this story about uh, this reoccurring uh, little princess that I talk about named Gleevee. Uh, not the most original name because or Avi's middle name is Glee, and the last part of her first name is V, and so Gleevee. <laughs> you can kind of draw the two together. But I, I have probably a hundred stories or more that I've told about Gleevee so far in uh, Avi's short life. And so I told this story about. Uh, Gleevee going to the circus and uh, seeing this uh, clown juggle balls and uh, Gleevee just wanted to learn how to juggle and so her mom got her these balls to juggle and uh, Gleevee tried to juggle all three immediately just like the clown and every single one of those balls hit her on top of the head and Gleevee wanted to give up she wanted to stop juggling because it just wasn't working but then her mom talked to her about how it takes time, and you have to start small, start with one ball, just tossing it up in the air, and you know, I'm telling essentially A.V. how to juggle here, and I don't know how to juggle. I've never juggled a day in my life, so I don't know if this is the correct way to do it, but I, you know, I'm telling her to do one ball in the, in the air at a time, and then you just do one ball back and forth between hands, and then two to balls kind of back and forth between two hands, and before long, if you practice and practice and practice, you can get three balls going at once, and, and A.V. thought this was a fun little story, and then the next day, Avi's drawing kitty cats on a piece of paper, because if you know my children, they are obsessed with kitty cats. And so she's drawing a kitty cat on a piece of a paper, and she decides she wants to cut it out, and so Kelsey lets her have her little kid scissors, and she's trying to cut out this kitty cat, and she just doesn't want to cut a big circle around it. She wants to cut out the exact lines of the kitty cat. Well, she's five and a half. I know adults who can't cut the exact lines of a kitty cat out. And so naturally, she's failing. She's not doing it very well. And she looks at me in frustration and says, I just can't do it. And I said, Avi, remember our story last night? Sometimes to get good at something, you have to practice She wanted to be good immediately, but she needed to practice to get better at cutting. And so I told her that, yes, it's not going to be good at first. I told her this story about uh, when I was a little kid, apparently I was a very good drawer. I could draw very well. And my mom was helping out at kindergarten one day, and uh, 
I, they were told to draw an animal, and apparently I decided to draw a bear. And my mom, who is a very good artist and used to sell stuff at craft shows of her uh, different paintings and different things like that, very good, um, said that what I drew actually looked like a bear. And I was, only, I was in kindergarten, and she couldn't believe it, that it actually looked like a bear. And uh, even the teacher thought it looked like a bear. And then she said, I was tasked with coloring it. And when I got done coloring it, it was a brown blob. <laughs> And no one would ever know how good of a bear I drew because my coloring was so horrible. And she was so disappointed. And uh, she likes to tell this story. And sure enough, to this day, I can draw and I have good penmanship and anything that requires very strict, like firm grasp on something I do well. And if you ask me to paint or color, I'm not great at it. Now, don't get me wrong. I can stay in the lines on a coloring book but I'm not great at it. But it took practice to even get to where I am today on coloring and stuff like that with AV. It takes practice. Well, just like with anything else, as Christians, it takes practice. It takes practice to be a Christian. And we have Peter here writing a second letter. And you can tell he's writing it to the same people because he actually builds upon what he wrote in the first book. And he's once again talking about living a holy life. And he says it takes practice to be holy. You're not going to get it overnight. It's not going to happen instantly. And we know that this is that process that we talked about in our last uh, series on 1 Peter, where we talked about the issue of sanctification. This element of salvation where you're becoming more and more holy by living a Christian life, trying to become more and more like God. And so Peter readdresses this. So obviously, they needed some uh, more direction on how exactly do we be holy. And so he addresses this. And he says that we need to practice being holy. And specifically, we need to practice certain qualities to be holy. Now, if you like lists like me, you'll enjoy this next section. If you don't like lists, I'm really sorry. (laughs) Um, but we're going to dive into a list that the biblical writers seem to like to make lists. And he goes into a list, and so what I want to do, because often when we make a list, we just kind of read over them real clearly, and be like, okay, yeah, you understand all that stuff, so let's move on. I want to break down each thing in the list and talk a little bit about each one, and then we're going to kind of wrap up with a summary on how does this affect us and to make it part of our lives. And so if we read, turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, We're going to read verses 3 through 8. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, or Peter, is laying a framework of what it takes to become more and more holy. What it takes to become sanctified, to be sanctified. And the very first thing that he brings forth is faith. Now specifically, when he's talking about faith here, he's talking about belief in Jesus and the knowledge found in him. So he's talking about who Jesus is and who Jesus was and what he taught. That's the kind of faith that he's talking about. Belief in those things. Now sometimes faith can mean trust, And it can mean like you're putting your faith in God. The way that Peter is using faith here isn't so much that, but it's faith as in belief. It's meaning that you believe that what is said about Jesus and who Jesus was is true. And so it starts there. If you want to be sanctified, you have to wholeheartedly believe that that is absolute truth. But it needs to be supplemented by things. Yes, faith is what saves us, but it needs to be supplemented by something for sanctification to truly happen. And so the first thing that he brings up is that it's supplemented with virtue. Faith with virtue. 
And virtue is a word we don't often use very much anymore unless you have heard, you know, virtues and vices, you know, we kind of, but that's more of a, we say those just for alliteration purposes so that help us remember things. And so, uh, but virtue is essentially integrity. It's essentially having a strong moral backbone, having strong moral principles. It's meaning that you know what's right and wrong and you will stand up for what's right. That's what virtue is. So he's saying, yes, have faith, but also make sure that your integrity is intact. Make sure that your belief is there, but make sure that that belief is accompanied by integrity, the ability to stand up for what you know is morally right. And then we supplement virtue with knowledge. Now, knowledge is a very broad word, and it's easy. We could almost throw anything in there, and you could think, well, well, knowledge, that's easy. You know something. We know about Jesus. We know that he died and rose again. But it's more than just that, because when Peter's talking about here, he's not talking about basic knowledge that saved you at the beginning, that basic knowledge that we're just trying to get children to understand, where they understand right and wrong and know that Jesus died for them, and they have that understanding that he rose from the dead and that they can uh, obtain salvation because of who Jesus is and the sacrifice that he made. It's beyond that. You see, this is more in line with a deeper spiritual knowledge. In fact, we might say solid food. That basic knowledge is milk, and we're wanting solid food. In fact, if we look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, it says this, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. You see, right there, it's talking about practice again, about constant practice, in fact, being trained. And the writer of Hebrews, which I do not believe was Peter, says something very similar to Peter, that it takes practice. And they're talking about this practice of discernment, this practice of the knowledge that we need to know what is right and to do the right thing. It's beyond just the knowledge that we need just to be saved. It's beyond that. It goes deeper than that. And so if we truly want to become more holy, we have to gain knowledge. And that requires us to be in the Word, to be in the Word and to learn what true knowledge is to learn how to live a Christian life, to learn what is truly right right from wrong and who exactly God is to the core. But beyond this, we also need to supplement knowledge with self-control. It's fine to have all knowledge in the world, but without self-control, it doesn't mean much. And so with self-control, we see it's not uh, just that you don't let your Christian... or It's not just that you uh, have restraint over your emotions and impulses and desires, that you show discipline. But it's also this aspect of the fact that, yes, you have Christian freedom, but don't let your Christian freedom justify moral permissiveness. Yes, you have a right to do something. As Paul says, do you have a right to do something? Yes, but that doesn't mean you should. Just because you can and just because God will forgive you for doing something doesn't mean that you should do that thing. We need to be above that. We need to show some discipline and making sure the things that we know about God and what he wants from us, we're making sure that we do them and we don't do the things that makes him sad. We don't do the things that upset him. And we gain that from knowledge. We gain that from the knowledge that we find out in Scripture And whenever we express self-control, the next thing is we supplement self-control with steadfastness. And so we have steadfastness, which again is a word that we don't often use today, but essentially it means perseverance or endurance. And so we continue on. And we continue on because we know the truth of Scripture. We continue on because we have the self-control to do so. And so we continue on and we are able to withstand temptation and hardships and persecution, and whatever is thrown at you because you have steadfastness. And so whenever something comes along and rocks the boat, you can stay in the boat because you're steadfast. 
When the winds of life come in and bl try to blow you down, your feet are on solid ground and you are unwilling to falter or fall because you have steadfastness. And then we supplement that steadfastness with godliness. And this is, in some ways, is the core of what we're talking about here because it's essentially holy living. Godliness is holy living. It's actually uh, becoming more and more like God, becoming more and more uh, like the creator of all. And this is both in behavior and attitude in this context. And so we have to remember that this holy living is not out of obligation, but out of respect for God. You see, we do this because of who God is, and we do this because we want to please Him. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because we love Him. We do it. We are not under the law anymore. There are not a set of laws that we have to follow. But we do these things, not because we are morally obligated, because why wouldn't we when you love Jesus? And if you love Jesus, then of course you would do everything in your power to follow after Him. Because that's what love is. And then godliness with brotherly affection. In fact, some of your passages might even say brotherly love, which you'll probably uh, recognize brotherly love. We get the word Philadelphia, which actually means brotherly love, from this. And so this love specifically is a love between family members. And it's a word, brotherly love is one word in the Greek, and there's four words for love in Greek. And so when we see love in the Bible, it actually kind of muddles it a bit because it makes it harder for us to understand because we have one word for their four words. So that makes it harder. And so it's so much about context when we read it in the English language. But here it was a word, uh, philia, which is essentially tender feelings and loving actions is what it is. And so this brotherly love that, that we call brotherly love is essentially tenderly feel, tender feelings towards someone and loving actions to someone. Now, part of me thinks, what brothers are they talking about? Because I don't know too many brothers that act like that. But I, I think we get the point. I think we get the point on when you have a family member that you are tender towards them, you have these tender feelings with them, and you naturally are doing loving actions, trying to help them out whenever possible. I don't know how many times I've moved or done something else. And yes, there's people from the church there, but there's also family that came a long way to help me. And I know many of you probably have family in the town that you live in, and so it's real easy to get help moving something because you're saying, okay, you know, why don't you just come over and help me? You're just, you know, a few blocks away. Um, at different times, my family's been as much as seven, eight hours away, and they drive just to help me move. They get no reward from it. In fact, I don't even often had the money to give them gas money. It came out of their own pocket to help. That is the kind of loving actions that I think we're seeing here. This wanting to help others because of this, that bond that you have, because it's a family bond. And we as Christians should have that family bond. We should have that family bond where we want to do things for people because we just love them so much. And so when we're looking at people within the church, we care about those people and we want to help them in any way that we can. And so we do so. And then we supplement brotherly affection with love. So essentially, you supplement love with love. Now, again, this is one of those times where the Greek gives us more insight because the word here for love is agape, love. We sub supplement philia with agape. And many of you have probably heard this word before because it's one that's become kind of popular. It's a Greek word that has become known even in Christian circles and even outside of Christian circles sometimes because um, it's a love that is unconditional love, a self-sacrificial love. It's a love that is willing to die for others. It's the love that Jesus had for us on the cross. It's the love that God had for us when he sent his son to die on the cross for us. It's a love that is not dependent on the actions of the person that's being loved. So the person that is loving, it doesn't matter about the person, what the person that's being loved is doing. It doesn't matter what they do to you, you will love them. It doesn't matter how bad they are to you, you will still lay down your life for them. I think of a, a child. I think of a child who is willing to uh, 
kind of spit in the face of their father or mother and basically tell them they want nothing to do with them and flee the house and never want to talk to him again. But you better believe if this mother or father truly show love that if their child needed anything from them, they would be there. And the reason is, is because they have this agape, this unconditional love for that child, that it doesn't matter what the child has done, they will love them. It's the same kind of love that God has for us. It's the same kind of love that we are called to have for one another. We should be willing to die for one another. And it doesn't matter what the other person has done for you, you are willing to do it because you have this love. You see, this love is not dependent on emotion. It's not devoid of emotion. Often emotion is there, but the emotion doesn't affect it at all. You could be very angry with the person, but you will show, still show this kind of love because it's the right thing to do. You see, in many ways, the reason why Peter ends with this one, he ends with the agape love, is because he knows that this love encompasses all of the other qualities. If you eventually get to this level of love, you've probably naturally already shown all of the other qualities. But to get there, it takes practice. It's not always easy. You see, this kind of love is above all else, and is the most important thing that a Christian can show. In fact, in Colossians 3.14, in Colossians uh, 3.14, Paul is talking about a little bit of the things that we should put on as Christians, some of the things that we should do as Christians, and he ends with this, above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole chapter is on love, but it's really a whole chapter on love in the context of spiritual gifts and how we interact with others within the body of Christ is why he's talking about love in general. But then he ends the very last verse of the love chapter of the Bible, ends with this. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I don't know about you, but faith and hope are pretty important, and they're pretty amazing. But Paul says here, the greatest of all of them is love. It binds everything together. It is greater than even faith and hope. It is the one thing that sets Christianity apart from everything else, this unconditional love where you're willing to die for one another, not because you have some kind of special like relationship with them, and that you're married, or that you're even your uh, brother or sister or daughter or son or something like that, but you're willing to die for them solely because you have the love for humanity that Christ has. And so Christ was willing to die for us, and we need to be willing to die for one another. Now, I'm not saying that you're ever going to be asked to die for someone, (laughs) but that ability to love like that we are called to do. We are called to do it. In fact, Peter talks a little bit about this continual practice and this continual calling to do so. And he says so in First Peter chapter or Second Peter chapter one, verse ten. So just a couple of verses down. He says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. How do you live a Christian life? How do you make sure that you are sanctified? Then you practice these things. In fact, he says that be diligent. Be eager to continue to practice these things. In fact, verse 5 actually says, to start all this off, it says, make every effort. This is a continual verbiage here where he's saying to continue to make every effort, to continue to be diligent. Don't stop. And practicing these qualities validates that we are God's people by living like God's people should. We should live how God wants us to live. And we do that by practicing these qualities, by living out these qualities. That way people can see what it means to be like Christ. 
And so we show these things. In fact, James chapter 2, the book of James is probably my favorite book of the Bible. I love just the practicality of it, where it teaches you so many things and you can really apply it to your life. But James chapter 2 says these words, that basically your faith without deeds or works is dead. And so we have these qualities, these things that we should be practicing to show people who Christ is, not because we are saved by these things, again, but because when we have these things, we are displaying who Jesus truly is. And it shows the fruit of our faith and who we really are. In fact, there was a man a theologian who often in our movement uh, we tend to be opposed to because uh, he is the father of a theology that we don't always match up with. But John Calvin, who uh, we often don't see eye to eye in our movement with him, but he said something that I think is fitting here. And he said these words. He said, salvation is by faith alone, which I agree with, you are saved by faith alone. Salvation is by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. And what he meant was, yes, you are saved by your faith and faith alone, but if you truly have saving faith, you have more than just faith. (laughs) And I agree. I agree. We practice these qualities because it's not just about faith. We need to supplement our faith with other things. And so we supplement our faith with virtue and knowledge, and self-control, and steadfastness, and godliness, and brotherly affection, and above all, we supplement our faith with love. And so as we leave here today, I hope that you want to become better Christians, and become more and more sanctified, which means we are becoming more and more perfect. But to be perfect, it takes practice. So as we leave today, let's practice our faith. Let's practice these qualities, and above all, practice love. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you. Thank you for showing us what true love is through the self or through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that we can follow in that footsteps, that we can live for you, and that we can uh, show people what faith is truly about by practicing these qualities. Help us do so this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. A few announcements before we leave today. The first is uh, there's a couple of things that uh, they're actually ending uh, coming up. The Rule King receipts need to be to Jamie really today because she's got to get them in before this month ends. And so if you have any Rule King uh, receipts from the 2nd through the 15th from the Vandalia location, uh, you can get those to Jamie and she's putting those in. And then um, basically uh, they'll give us 10% of the the sales off of that um, in a check. So we thank you for those of you that have already turned those in. And if you still have any of those, uh, just give them to Jamie and then she can get those in. Um, Also... uh, uh, we're coming up on the end of the baby bottle campaign. That ends at the beginning of September. And so if you haven't gotten yours in yet, uh, we ask you to please get those in uh, to us or take them over to the pregnancy center yourself and th- they can take them there. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're supporting that ministry. Um, also, we're having a couple collections going on right now. If you have any uh, lightly used shoes that you feel like you're not wearing anymore that you want to donate, um, that is for the pregnancy center as well. And the big box that's uh, decorated in uh, baby paper back there, baby wrapping paper, is for that. You can just put the shoes in there, and that's going to be going on for a while. And so uh, we'll collect in those. And then the Helping Hands Food Pantry has asked uh, for some canned goods. And you can donate you know, any non-perishable item, but they specifically asked for canned goods specifically. And so if you have any canned goods or don't mind picking some up for them, um, you know, they get a lot of donation and food-wise, but so much of they have to supplement it with other things to really make ends meet over there to help as many people as they're trying to. And I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure in this time where people have lost jobs or trying to figure things out, I'm sure their ministry is as busy as ever, if not busier. And so we want to help out with that. And so if you can, 
uh, please uh, donate some canned goods for that. Um, also, I have an announcement real quick. On the 13th of September, there's going to be a gospel sing at 5 p.m. at Carter's Patio. And if you are interested in uh, doing something with that or helping with that or going and have any questions, you can ask Sherry, and she's more than happy to answer anything that you might uh, need for that. Um, and, or if you just want to attend and listen, that's okay too. At 5 p.m. on September 13th, uh, you can come to that. And then also, um, if you haven't given yet today, you can still give online or send a check because today is our fifth Sunday. And so we're trying to collect $15,000 uh, to help pay for the church. And we are doing well on that. Uh, but we want to get this building paid off as soon as possible and uh, get to where we can start work on the, the other part of the building too. And so that requires us to continue making our payments and getting things paid down. And when we can pay extra on the principal, it means that that's less interest that we have to pay in the long run. And so we want to do that and be good stewards of the money that God has given us. Um, I want to thank you for coming today. And uh, On the concert on September 13th, if anybody wants to do a special or a song or play or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, let me know so that Bob, my brother Bob is kind of in charge of it and um, he can put you in the list. Yeah, so if you're interested in actually participating in it, just let Sherry know. And, uh, uh, and probably sooner rather than later so we can get you involved in that. So, um, But thank you for coming today. You'll be dismissed after the closing song. Thank you.